Hi everyone, small audience, big heart, right? <laughs> okay, um, my name is Andre and I'm going to talk, well, my name is Andre, I'm unpronounceable and un unspellable last name. I'm going to talk about design by introspection. Um, I assume most of you are students who do, who do research on programming languages. Well, aside from Mr. Professor, thank you for coming, Daniel. Um, uh, so, uh, this is uh, not research, it's an in in industrial talk. And uh, um, the D Language Foundation, who, uh, well, which I'm a part of, is, uh, would be thrilled to have some bright minds like yours. Uh, work on the D language a bit. I think there's uh, quite a few good ideas in the language uh, and in the milieu that surrounds it. Uh, and uh, they would be uh, greatly helped by, uh, by a bit of uh, academic uh, research. So uh, let me uh, start with a brief introduction. You know, um, that's not really uh, the gist of the talk, but it has to do with, um, uh, with you know, the history of the D language and, and such. So, um, I think um, it's not difficult to make the argument that systems uh, level programming remains a necessity. There's all this talk nowadays about, well, what with the light of speed um, suddenly became unpassable, right? It's a constant. Uh, that was a huge news flash a few years ago. That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> it didn't go very well. I don't care, I'm still gonna make it. So. Um, there's been a lot of issues with uh, not only the light, uh, speed of light being limited, which actually uh, you know, limits, uh, puts a hard limit on, uh, on the frequency that we can run our clocks with, but there's also like the notion of the trace. Uh, actually, I remember I read in the news just a, a month ago that Intel dropped its plans for uh, reducing the, the, what they call the feature size, the, the minimum width of a trace in a chip. Uh, for the simple reason that the defect rate is, would be very large. Uh, what happens uh, is that once the trace gets, it's, it's, setting, it's stepping on 12, molecule, 12 atoms of silicon right there. So once you get to eight, uh, the slightest, if there's one atom missing, you have like 12% uh, you know, reduction in the current that you can pass through, so already it's a defect, so you have a problem. So essentially we're not getting uh, faster, we're not getting smaller, so we gotta do what, with what uh, what we have. So at this point, uh, a lot of uh, the efficiency we need in today's computing, we need to find in the people's minds, as it were. Uh, and this is where our ideas come to, uh, uh, come to the fore. So, you know, there will be a plenty of domains in which faster is better. I was just uh, having this uh, great conversation with a couple of uh, uh, colleagues in, uh, in the cafeteria. And it, was, it was about Uber. And one great discovery of, uh, at Uber was that Transportation is uh, elastic. Uh, there's this whole notion that you know uh, traditional cab drivers thought if you put more taxis on the road, they're going to lose money because there's, people are not going to want more taxis because there's just so many people. It turns out that demand is elastic. So there's the more taxis you have on the road, and the cheaper it gets, the more people are going to want to take a taxi, and it's going to just go like that, surprisingly, a lot, right? Surprisingly much. Uh, similarly, in the systems, um, in, in the computing uh, realm. We have a bunch of domains in which there's, you know, there's, the faster you get, the better it gets. Uh, a few examples I'm sure you can, we can gather from the audience. Like what would be a domain in which if you have a, a twice as fast computer, you're going to be twice as happy? Yes, please. Games. Games, thank you very much. That, that's the prime <laughs> example. We have like too much, you know, you have too much uh, resolution, granularity of objects on the, you know, in the scenery. You have, you know, just plenty of opportunities. But I'll tell you something much more surprising. The faster a computer, the better Facebook gets. I worked for a, a small career at Facebook with the better part of six years. And I was like in the back end thing, which is like the least fun area of Facebook, okay? Nobody sees that. It's a, the, the JIT compiler. So then, you know, the, the whole story was like, you know, what if we, we, we make the back end faster? What's going to happen? Like, who's going to care? Is there, it turns out that people do care, and it's weird. Uh, there's two reasons. One is you save power. The faster you get your job done, the, the less power you use for that. So it turns out like every 1% of power, every 1% efficiency you get on the Facebook backend, you save a few million dollars a year. So they only big money, because I'm like a few, like 
<laughs> they should pay me like a lot of dividends now. So anyway, um, but that's all, not only the only that's that's the obvious effect, but there's a less obvious effect, and there's been studies uh, in uh, UX and and such made by Google, Amazon, and Facebook, and all uh, concur with the following notion, um, which is the faster an interface is, the more users would be compelled to click around and spend time on the interface, right? So that's a classic, and I remember like Facebook's uh, arch enemy at the time, MySpace, uh, the day they melted down, uh, the time to interaction was 40 seconds. So if you click on something, you have to wait for 40 seconds on average. You can imagine how that, that is not a very compelling user experience. Uh, getting back to systems, so you know, there's plenty of domains, and gaming would be sort of the nice example for, uh, for folks our age, I'm including myself with like the younger <laughs> generation. But you know, the folks my age would need to re, uh, worry about 401k retirement, all that nonsense. In finance, it's, it's, a, huge, it's a huge domain in which the, the faster you get, the more analysis you can do, the more numbers you can crunch. And you have this time box between 4, 30, uh, one day and 9, uh, sorry, 4, one day and 9, 30, the next day, which is when the market closes and then opens. So you have this much time to do your number crunching and get to some interesting conclusions about what happened and what's going to happen. So there's just plenty of domains. I don't think there's a need to insist on that. Uh, Dylan, which had an ambition to uh, sort of uh, leave no room below, no, no room above. So you don't need to go down to assembler or you don't need to script in Python or a different language. You, would, you should have a language that is generous enough to allow you to do these uh, very low level and very high level things. And uh, one trend that has been like just running like crazy through the past couple of decades has been ever growing modeling needs. Everybody wants to do more complicated things, right? So you know how to multiply two matrices, I, I want a neural network. You have a neural network, I want deep learning. It's a, deep, a bit different, right? Uh, you have uh, that, I want an SVM. You know, so the more you have, the more you want. So there's been all, an ever growing modeling needs. And uh, the beginnings of D, in a sum, it's kind of summarized even by the name. Like I was in an elevator just now with, uh, with a colleague, and I said, oh, I'm working on the D language. And said, oh, D, that's like after C, right? So that's, he immediately like figured out that there must be a connection there. Yeah, of course, yeah. So um, uh, in fact, the name of the language was Mars, but nobody called it Mars, everybody called it D. Ah, I know, it's like C++, after the increment. So it started as a better C++. What happened after is interesting because um, there, was a num there were a number of pressures on the creators of the language and the maintainers of the language, which was, well, yeah, we want to generate efficient code. We want to offload as much as possible to compilation time simply because, again, we were just limited by the computing environment. So there was pressure to support advanced modeling without complication. So that led to a, a, a state of affairs in which the D language had um, a pressure on it to put emphasis on compile time processing. And there's a research field that is close to that, which is called partial evaluation, which I'm sure some of you have you know, looked at because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's sort of its program languages kind of, kind of thing. Um, so uh, then we got to uh, a point where we're looking at uh, defining features that are amenable to that kind of stuff. I'm going to take a, this is kind of a hello world. I, I had to have a slide with hello world. Do you agree? I assume not everybody knows about the D language much. So it's like, okay, what would hello world look in this terrible language? So it looks pretty much as you'd expect. Uh, but you know, I'm just presenting just to make a parenthesis about uh, a small uh, principle of language design that I think uh, is very important. Here's the thing. Um, do you agree that composition is a good thing? We agree that composition, okay. So there is a, here we have a lack of composition because we have a void main function which writes line ostensibly to the console, to the standard output as it were, like in C, right? Uh, it writes something to the console and that's very nice. We have a function, why do they have to have a function? Well, in large applications, it's better to, that everything is a function, they don't have top level code. Even in Python, people define main in large applications, right? If you're like, ah, oh, good style is if it's one, over 100 lines of code, you're gonna define the goddamn main there, right? So, uh, indeed, you can't, you must define a main function. 
So that's the main function. We'll have to see both at the top, which would be like the pounding through in C, right? The equivalent. So now here's the opportunity. Uh, there is a lack of composition here because this function depends on this import. But they're like different. They're, it could be like 100 lines down. And the, comp, you know, the, the, the dependency is not reflected in the layout. So here's what I'm going to do. So I move the import inside. If you ever do this in C, your career is not going to move well. <laughs> it's a career limiting kind of thing to do. Yes, please. Yeah, but you can do it in C++. You can do it using STDC out um, inside the method. You can do that. Using would be uh, assuming that you include a header already. So yeah, using fair, would just put, pull the namespace. All right. So um, in fact, uh, so this is composition because I want to compose the notion of I'm importing some library with the notion that I'm in a function and I want to import it right here, locality, right? So actually, the, the Daniel's talk this morning was very inspiring because he has all his concepts and stuff. And if we planned this together, it wouldn't, wouldn't have uh, come better. So all of these kind of high level concepts, we have composition and we have a concept of uh, locality and scoping and what, uh, what stuff and what not. And they should compose. They should, I should compose uh, uh, locality with, uh, with importing libraries. So then I wrote this. Um, actually, I wrote this intently. And I said, so I wrote it, it wouldn't compile and said, you're not supposed to do that. So, true story. I called Walter Bryan, the creator of the D language, friend. So, Walter, this doesn't compile. He said, let me look in the code. So, he looked in the front end and he said, well, the first line in the import statement type checking, it says uh, if you're not at the top level, you can't do that. There's an error. And he just kind of throws an error and goes away. And I said, well, don't you comment out that line? <laughs> and he commented out, it, it worked. And the rest is history. It, it was an amazing piece of. Uh, uh, so, <coughs> well, it makes a lot of sense, and if you think of it, it's just the same sensible thing to do. But this takes a, has a, a number of secondary effects that are very interesting. Again, this is not the talk. It has nothing to do with design by introspection, by the way. So we're wasting time right now. But I think it's a good parenthesis. Uh, getting, uh, getting for, moving forward with the parenthesis, um, we have the situation whereby traditionally we have modules depend on modules. We have the de dependency concept, right? So modules depend like files depend on files. And we have like make, and any build tool is going to look at files that depend on files. But this is different. We have fragments of files depend on files. Because outside, the, outside main, there's no dependency on SDDIO. It, it may be in other places if I put it explicitly, but it completely changes the environment. And guess what? If you have a library that has a 1 million lines of code and you put them in 1,000 files, each has 1,000 lines, right? If you do it dependency the traditional way, it's going to take a long time to do it. If you put dependency in this way, the, whatever functions are not used, they're going to be lazy. They're going to be compiled lazily and they're going to compile it. It's going to take four seconds to build the damn. One million lines library. Yes, please. But of course, the answer the, the answer is the, the linker can already do that. Uh -huh. It can uh, ah. it can find that function. The linker. And them. I'm sorry. Uh, let me see if I have the slide. No, we don't have the slide. But I have it in here. So the linker came. Who knows how a linker works? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have like one, two, three, four, six slides. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows how linker works. We, we know at the level, right? So, uh, unless the designer of gold is in, in this <laughs> um, But, you know, a linker at the very basic level, it works. It's going to start, you know, it's going to uh, generate the object, uh, the object file. It's going to generate the code. And whenever there's a function code that has not been resolved, it is going to put four zeros instead of the function address, correct? And it's going to make a reference. I'm going to have to solve this reference. So then it's going to look in the object files, trying to resolve references. And that's step one. And step one is easy. Step two is when uh, it didn't resolve all the symbols. And then it gets into the famous linear search for libraries. And then that's the big time, right? It's going to open a library. And it's going to open directly. It's going to look for libraries in a linear fashion until it's going to find the printf function that you were meant to call. And that's actually the slow and difficult process of, of linking. Uh, it turns out that that's, it takes a long time. The sheer fact that you can compile Hello World and get it running in one second on C++ is a miracle of current technology. 
I gotta tell you, like, I, we should wake up every morning, like at 7 a.m., try Hello World, and say, oh my God, this is, what a world we live in. This is fantastic, friends. So, anyhow, uh, the interesting thing about this way of uh, designing libraries is there's less pressure on the linker. The fewer symbols the linker has to resolve, the faster the whole, comp uh, the whole compilation and linking process takes. So even though a linker in principle could do that, it has a very inefficient mechanism to do that, whereas the language is under your control. Um, so indeed, you know, just to uh, kind of illustrate this principle, everything can be scoped everywhere, so the composition works nicely. <coughs> All right, so um, <laughs> we'll get into uh, more of the topic. Still, we're still not doing the talk. We're still wasting time right now. We're still wasting time. Because I want to kind of make a preface to the, the whole thing. Uh, the static if statement, which was the first interesting uh, thing in the D language that I, uh, that I noticed was, well, what the hell is with this language? Like a C++ only like has, you know, different syntax here and there. And it's like um, me too, 90% of the time. But it had this thing, well, one thing that it was, well, static if. It's like an if that is resolved during compilation. Right? Okay, oh, interesting. So we start as, uh, okay, so we have palm diff in C, which is terrible. It doesn't cooperate with the rest of the language. You can't put anything interesting in there, et cetera, et cetera. So um, Walter Bright said, how about I make a static if, which is integrated with the rest of the language? And the meaning is simple. Static if condition Boolean during compilation. If so, compile this code. Otherwise, compile this other code. Simple as that. It turns out it's a, it's a very interesting thing because, first of all, it asks, uh, it puts, um, how should I put it? In order for static, so static if was a great discovery. I'm, I'm telling you, it was, a, it was something like, oh my God, this is just, this is the designer's fork. You know the fork function in Unix? It's that because whenever you write static if, it's like, well, if this condition is true, I'm going to go with this design, and otherwise I'm going to go with a completely different design. <laughs> And they multiply, they combine. It's uh, you know, it's like so. But let, let's get to that in a minute. Before that, it uh, fosters this uh, this pressure on other aspects of the language. For example, what can I evaluate? What is reasonable to evaluate statically during compilation? Because the more you can evaluate statically, the more you can put in that static if thing. If you can, if you have like the size of a type and that kind of stuff, it's too little. So this actually culminated in what is called in the D language compile time function, function evaluation. So in the, the D language, your full function can be evaluated during compilation. You can create objects, create arrays, expand arrays, allocate memory, do stuff, do interesting stuff <coughs> every turn, and that whole thing would be evaluated during compilation. So, uh, but it started with the, the simple statement, well, I want to evaluate, you know, to the static if. And then what program elements can I examine? What can I look at to make decisions uh, upon? So let me give an example uh, from Weka.io. Weka.io is the fastest, is a company in Israel which is, is using D full stack. And they're, they're the, they make the fastest uh, network storage in the world. They're really the best. They're like an amazing startup. And they have, I actually visited the company and uh, one funny thing I've done was I counted the number of static if. And they have one static if every 25 bytes of code. <laughs> and they, it was, I mean, I was preaching to the choir saying, oh, actually, this is a remarkable thing. And they said, of course, otherwise we, so by the way, they're like bitching to me, like day in and day out, I'm visiting for four days. There are four days of complaints. <laughs> right? These guys could not, like, I couldn't do well, right? So, oh, this is bad, this has a bug, this is terrible, this is, we want that, we don't want that. So, oh, okay, I'm fine. And then, at some point, I forgot, at some point, I said, well, you know, why wouldn't you use C++ for that point? And they said, we, we wouldn't be able to even consider it in C++. So, I was very, I said, well, how about all everything you said of these past four <laughs> days? <laughs> complaining and that kind of stuff. So, there are stuff that has understood, has grokked, has, has gotten, how you can com uh, compress a variety of design choices in a very small space. This is a hash table design. Uh, by the way, crash course on D syntax. Strut is strut. Um, Robbing hash table is rubbing hash table. Okay, <laughs> open parent, this is a generic type parameterized on other types. Right? 
And you can parameterize on ties, but you can also parameterize on an integer or a floating point or a string or pretty much anything, any value. So you can parameterize on a type on a value. This part here must be known during compilation. So you can't read from the terminal a length a number and put it here. You can't do that. This is com compilation time, right? It's not like JIT style, it's more like compiler style. So we have a, a message, we have a key, the value type, and we have some static keys here. And we go, well, what if uh, you know the max length is less than usual dot max minus one? That would be the maximum. That would be pretty much like 65, 535, or whatever, right? So that would be the maximum value represented in 16 bits. So then you 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 uh, you're going to say, well, my cell my cell IDX must be a usual, otherwise it's going to be an assigned integer. So you're going to allocate the appropriate length of cell, right? And here you have again a calculation depending on the size of and you pack the structure differently. A uh, simple question for everybody. So this is like the second part of the structure, it's like an else. Uh, simple question for you all. How many possible layouts do I have here? Yes, please. Four. Four, thank you. It's two bits. Yeah. So it could be like true and false, and I have four possi possible layouts. But consider this if I approach this in, in a traditional like C language, I would have to write the same the layout four times. So that's the whole the whole advantage that we have here, and this kind of stuff is uh, is um, pervading uh, the Weka IO uh, source code. You see it every everywhere they they can. Every time they can, they they're going to evaluate something during compilation and uh, make for very compact code. So um, finally, we get to the talk. Welcome to my talk. My name is Andre, and I'm going to talk about design by introspection. Uh, but uh, even before we get into that, I got to give you a little history about design patterns and friends. So you're never going to get to the talk, right? It's an uh, uh, asymptotic kind of uh, path here. Um, Policy-based design was uh, a C++ uh, specific term which uh, said, you know, we're doing patterns with templates. Uh, who, know, who knows about the policy-based design? It's like a very risky question to ask in uh, anywhere because I invent, I, I turned, the, I coined the term. So I'd be like Salieri saying, "Oh, did you hear this melody?" And say, "I know it. Yeah, it's good. It's oh, that's Mozart. That's not me. <laughs> Nobody heard about me, right?" So anyway, uh, I gotta tell you this: if you go to Wikipedia and you go to the you know program paradigms in Wikipedia, it's going to be there alongside with seventy-five others. So it's seventy-six uh, of these program paradigms, and I'm. I have this weird pride of being there, like an idiot. I mean, really, I didn't invent anything, I gave the name. And the name is policy-based design, and it has to do a lot with, well, we have the, the design patterns, and now we have the uh, C++ templates, which are a way to kind of generate things from things. And I use that as a, as a macro processor, if you wish. So, um, Again, not to brag, this is just by means of context, okay, an introduction. And uh, this is a very relevant quote uh, from a pattern community uh, fellow. And he said, the design pattern solution is to turn a programmer into a fancy macro processor. Friends, when you hear fancy and you hear macro and you hear processor, you kind of want to be in that line of business, don't you? That's kind of a fun thing, right? It's like, oh my God, this is something I, it's, I want to be there. Right, fancy microprocessor, yes, I want to be that. So, um, design patterns do this. But now, you know, the obvious second question is like, well, I, you know, we're, we're, we want to automate, right? We, anything, you know, anything that is automatable, we want to automate. So then, how about this? Uh, let me bring, let me kind of uh, channel uh, Richard Feynman um, here, and he said, what would happen if we could arrange the atoms one by one the way we want them? And that started a whole new field. It was a paper by Feynman, and it started a whole new field, which was, <coughs> thank you, nanotechnology. He said, you know, did you say that? Oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. So nanotechnology was started by this seminal paper by Feynman, in which he said, actually, if you arrange atoms by hand, you break no laws of physics, and no, no laws of physics, and you, have, you can create whatever you want. You can create any any uh, compounds you want. The problem is we have two big hands. Well, our hands are too big. 
Except for Trump. Trump has small hands. But... <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us have big hands, right? <laughs> so, and that kind of, the, the, whole, uh, the whole notion of like, uh, you know, the nanotechnology, how to assemble molecules using these small machines and all, all of these great things uh, started here. And my question to you is like, what if you take this and that, right? You have these two codes and say, well, what if, what if I could actually uh, assemble design elements by hand? Maybe I have some, you know, maybe I have some, uh, some possibility to look at uh, design elements such as objects, structure, data structures, functions, what have you, methods, right? And I can assemble them by hand, but not by making my own decisions, but by writing my decisions on paper, on, in code using static if as the enabler, right? So here's the idea, the core idea, designed by introspection. Uh, in patterns, the programmer expands the mental macros. So I know the pattern visitor, boom, I know what to do. And I write it down, yes? That's my visitor. So it's total plasticity, total flexibility, but there's no code reuse because every time I'm gonna have to write the code all over again. Uh, in policy-based design, you would have some macros, which are, would be templates and whatnot, and we have no plasticity, but we do have reuse. And in design by introspection, it's kind of uh, a weird in the middle mm. situation, whereby the programmer molds macros that communicate with and adapt to one another, and we get good plasticity and good code careers. Because each, uh, in, a mac in such a macro, if you wish, you can do this whole introspection business, which is, well, do you know how to measure your width? Do you have a width property? <clears throat> and if you do have a width property, then there's a number of assumptions I can make, ba make, uh, make based on that. But if there's no width property, then I can make another set of assumptions based on the fact that you don't have. The lack of an interface element is information, right? So, you know, it's a bit. It's not if it's not there, I'm toast. No, if it's not, oh, I'm gonna make a different decision. So, uh, to be able to do this kind of, uh, so, by the way, we're gonna get into examples in a minute. So, there's gonna be examples. So, if, if it seems too, like, vague, uh, don't, don't worry, we have very good examples. So, um, to do this kind of stuff, you need to have some input, which would be, well, I need to be able to look at types. And to say, do you know how to do that? Do you have this capability? What is your, you know, what, what are you uh, capable of? What are your capabilities? The simplest variant would be, do you support method X, X, Y, Z? People who do small talk do that all the time. Agreed? Yes. Isn't that, doesn't the, 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 the proposal for C++ do out something like this with the meta classes, I think? Um, there are two proposals. Yeah. One is meta classes by Herb Southern, which completely misses the point. He's a friend. He, yeah, he I, 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 and the second is uh, in the makings by Michael Spert is also a friend, and he he's getting the point, and my hope is that he's gonna he's gonna work on it real hard, right. right? But we're you're looking at you know retirement. Yeah, twenty right? thirty twenty. Yeah, so you're looking at that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, the simplest variant is: Do you know how to do X Y Z? Do you, do you have a length? Do you have a reallocate? Do you have a allocate? Do you have this method or that method or that other method? <coughs> so then we need to do some processing that uh, presumably is going to assemble these mythical components into a larger component and, and do interesting things. So then you need to have some uh, compile time evaluation capabilities. That would be the second ingredient without which you, you can't do. By the way, this, this looks really simple, but it's, uh, it's funny that nobody got it yet. Yes, please. So what if you what do you do if some other compile time evaluation defines method XYZ? How do you figure that out? Uh-huh. What if you have a race condition? Is that because you could have a race condition. If A doesn't exist, define B. And in another module, if B doesn't exist, define A. Well, that's undefined. Not really. So it, we 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 can't handle that. It would be too incomplete, I think, to even understand that that happens. So that's sort of an unresolved problem. It's an open issue. Um, it, uh, it's more of a, um, a scholar example than uh, something that occurs in practice. Uh, but it, it did happen. People can, oh, what if I say it's exactly like this? Static if A exists, uh, sorry, static if A does not exist, define B. 
different modules static if B doesn't exist define A. And that depend, depends on the order in which the things are going to become compiled, which is ridiculous, right? It shouldn't be like that. So that's, that's a problem. Uh, thank you. Uh, somebody's following here. All right, so uh, to process things, we would need some sort of arbitrary compile time evaluation facility. And it turns out that, again, uh, in the D language, um, we is, is started, uh, you know, your language people, constant propagation? Yes, we know about. Okay, constant propagation, I said, well, let's do more and more constant propagation, it became its own thing. So oh, I want to do loop during a constant propagation, I want to do, I want to allocate memory during a constant, so it became a full-fledged evaluation engine. Now, there are limitations to this, however. For example, do you think it would be reasonable to open files while you compile things? Uh, write files? Why not? Yeah, why not? Yeah, why the hell not? Security, we don't care. <laughs> um, so you can't call uh, system functions. So you can't do things like uh, I.O. or, you know, kind of uh, RM everything, you know, slash, you know, slash star dash RF and that kind of stuff. So you can't actually call system functions. But as long as you stay within the confines of evaluation, so pure evaluation, of expressions, you're, you're, you're golden. During compilation, so everything is during compilation. Uh, I was making a parallel with Smalltalk uh, a minute earlier. And with Smalltalk, it's just a bit um, kind of different. Uh, in Smalltalk, you do all that good stuff, you just did during runtime. So you're kind of, in a way, spending time to get where you want to be. Uh, here, the emphasis is on speed. So you want to do everything you can during compilation, and then you have the design ready for runtime. So you want to have uh, this sort of uh, compile time evaluation, and then there will be the output, and there's got to be some way of uh, have all of the smart code ready to go. So I need to kind of write it somewhere. I need to output my code. Consider this as an example. Uh, consider a regular expression. So you take as input I don't know, dot star, and dot. That's too simple. Uh, give me a smart regular expression. So I don't. Know. A, a dot star B. So it starts with an A, any number of characters ends with a B, and that's a regular expression, right? So then if I write, uh, if I um, if I have to write a general regular expression matches, there's going to be an interpreter of that, right? It's not going to be very fast, because it's going to be able to accommodate not only A dot star B, but pretty much any regular expression. It's going to be a very generic engine. But now consider this. I take A dot star B. During compilation, and I generate code that is specialized in recognizing that one particular regular expression. Which means quite literally, I'm going to have if the first character is an A, uh, continue, whatever, you know, if not, the, the, you know, failure, whatnot. So I'm going to have a sequence like five lines of code, of source code that are going to recognize that one. It's going to be very good at that one regular expression completely inept at any other. Now, okay, so with this kind of stuff, up, on, up until now, up until now, I can do that, because I can look at the string, I can uh, do the automaton part, but then I need to output the code. So it's amazing how these things come together, but only, only once you have all three, because most languages have two out of three. It's kind of funny how you gotta close the circle to get the effects. And the, 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 thing, the third thing you want is to essentially convert some strings into code. And that's exactly what it does. B has a primitive which is called mixing, and you give it a string, and it's going to compile it as, a, as code. Lisp has that, a, a number of languages, so again, this is not new in a sense. What's nice is that they come together and they all come doing compilation. So, we have these uh, three facilities. So with input, we have introspection, and we have uh, compile time evaluation, and then we have the ability to generate code. And uh, this troika is very nice. Again, uh, most languages support two out of three, or kind of a bit of each, or that kind of stuff. So you gotta, you got to have all three. So with the, uh, you have a uh, facility called tipolo, which is going to give you all the, of the elements of a record. Is, you have, it has like traits and stuff. I'm not going to go into details here. Of course, you can uh, easily investigate uh, online if you want. Uh, with processing, you have uh, compile time function evaluation. You have static if and, and the others. 
And for output, I, I just mentioned you have uh, things like mixing. Template expansion can also be considered a, a form of expansion of things, right? Like if you come from a C++ uh, uh, background, you know that templates really are some sort of a macro that generates the specialized code for you. So that's a, it's clearly it's an expansion engine there. Uh, but with mixing, you get into the next level because you can expand arbitrary strings into code. So, um, all right, so let's see uh, how we can uh, kind of make sense of this all. And uh, let me talk a bit about optional interfaces. So this uh, Fitbit has a 70% hit rate here, like whenever I turn my hand, it's got to light up, it never does. Uh, okay, so optional interfaces are an interesting concept. I mentioned this already, like the absence of something or the presence of something, they are equally important information. Now let me, um, uh, let, let me explain uh, what I mean by that. <clears throat> Um, a design by introspection component typically prescribes the following. A number of uh, required primitives, you can imagine like a class in Java or C++ terminology, and it's required to implement a number of methods. But then there's a number of optional methods that are, may or may not be there. Um, by the way, this could be zero, and I notice that very often it is zero or one, or just very few. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples in a minute. But most primitives turn out to be optional, which means you may or may not implement them. You may or may not define them. And then, you know, this is, uh, this is affordable because whenever you give that to component to a, another library writer, they can inspect it. They can, during compilation, they can say, well, does it support this method? Maybe not, and th that's not good for me, but that's, maybe that's good, but in a different, in, in a different way. So inter introspection is going to query for these optional components. And again, what's missing is as important as what's present. So now uh, what we have here, friends, is a very compact way of defining you know, the power set. Right? What is the maximum number of, when you have like n possibilities and it can, each can be 0, 1, you have the power set uh, number of combinations uh, available. So you have up to 2 to the n possible interface in a very compact form. And that's nice because it avoids all the boilerplate by defining, having to specify million small interfaces or you know, a bunch of partial interfaces, and all, that, all, all that kind of nonsense. So it's a very compact way of defining interfaces. Once you have that, you get where you want to be. Uh, one, uh, one thing, so, you know, I've, much of my career was uh, dedicated to writing libraries. And uh, with libraries, a uh, huge problem is that you have this combinatorial effect. Uh, N clients, there's like, you know, the joke goes, 10 people have 11 needs for such a library, right? So it's never the same. Uh, there's always kind of a little comma they want in a different place, right? A little thing. You know, yeah, I, I like that, but I want that little thing that, that should be different and all that kind of stuff. So it's um, I actually, I, I miswrote, it's not exponential as much as combinatorial. Right? Because everybody wants this combination of features and it, it comes as a, as a weird uh, Cartesian product. So once you have uh, a facility that allows you to generate code like that, you're gonna have linear code. You're, you're not fighting the. You're not finding a, a combinator anymore. So, um, as I said, with static if that would be your magic design for. Whenever you use uh, static if again, you're going to double your, the number of capabilities that you, you offer. So that's really nice. And it's really interesting because when you think of if, you want to think of a language that doesn't have if, unless you're you because you're language people. I'm sure you can design a language that doesn't have if and kicks ass, right? I know, use like dispatch or whatever. Yes, please. I mean, you can use Prolog, right? Prolog, uh, that, does it have if? No, it doesn't. No, it just has like zebra and that kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's okay. how you do it. Yeah, so it does uh, unification over the place, right? Yep. Okay. Prolog is if. Sorry? Prolog is if. You can use the, the extension operator. You use the semicolon. There you go. Semicolon. Yeah, but you can do it now, isn't it, right? All right, so I'll let you find it also yeah. during the break. Um, Anyhow, so my point would be uh, runtime if is sort of in the time domain, if you wish. So it's like if this happens, your trace is going to go there and that kind of stuff. With static if is different because it, it, you know weird uh, point. It, it's not in time. 
It's in the Fourier transform. <laughs> it's a cosine discrete of the time. It's, it's a design time. And it's you, the programmer, it's as if instead of you making the decision in your mind, you're writing the decision process on paper, uh, on paper, on whatever, right? So you're writing, well, if this component supports that, I'm going to do that. Otherwise, I'm going to do that. It's similar to the process that you would have as the, during design of a, of a normal system. So uh, I find it very interesting that uh, I can't really place when this happens uh, psychologically and from a programmatic standpoint. So when, what does happen that the static decision is being made and that kind of stuff. Uh, at any rate, I did notice this one thing. Uh, the more of this you have, the more compact your code is going to be and with more capabilities. Um, and I'm going to give an example now. Uh, there's two examples that you can, uh, you can check online. One is uh, from the D language, uh, the allocator uh, framework. Uh, memory allocation is something that uh, folks like you, I trust, they have zero interest in. They're like, I know, I call you, and I'm done here with allocation, I know what to do. Is that, is that describing you? Okay, so some other people say, oh, when I call you, I know every electron where it goes. Okay, so I know everything that happens and that kind of stuff. So, um, actually, Emery Berger, who is at this conference, he wrote a number of very good allocators, uh, including Ford, uh, for which, you know, he, uh, uh, he, uh, he became famous, if you wish, and for many other things. But essentially, with uh, allocation, memory allocation is, a, is an interesting problem in and of itself, because um, there's many, very many strategies that people use depending on a number of, uh, of features. And uh, just to give you an example of the size compression here, uh, Jay Malloc, the best allocator in the world, used at Facebook and in many other places, is one allocator in 45,000 lines of code of C. And this guy is any number of possible allocator designs in 12,000 lines of code documented. And actually, it's kind of funny because these, uh, this set includes this particular allocator. So it takes you like, um, it's, a, it's a definition of 20 lines to implement what this guy does. It's a, it's a long it's a long type definition, and you say I'm gonna you know I'm gonna instantiate this particular code with these uh, parameters, and I'm going to get what J. Malloc does, and many others because it's uh, there's a lot of value in specializing allocators. It turns out. Ask Emery Berger, right? So um, uh, there's also work on collections, uh, collections like you know hash tables, maps, uh, dictionaries, uh, arrays, lists, uh, trees, and what have you. Uh, collections are a very interesting domain. Because who knows about Bloom filters? All right, I'm in the, I'm in the right audience here. All right, so Bloom, what would be a primitive of a Bloom filter? Uh, maybe find, maybe has, maybe belongs, yes? Find and insert. Yeah, but it's not find, it's really maybe. It's certainly not, and maybe. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. the, these are the primitives. <coughs> You can ask certainly not, it gives you like true if it's certainly the, the thing is not in there. And maybe it's there, maybe it returns a floating point number which gives you a probability because they, they, it's a well-defined probability, right? So um, it has a set of primitives that is very different from a usual container which is fine, are you there or not? And not fine means I, it's not there. So it's a very different interface. However, um, a hash table could implement the Bloom filter interface. By returning maybe there with always like it's there, it gives always a precise response, right? And that kind of stuff. So containers are a very interesting domain in which you have a variety of, um, of these primitive names and semantics. And you can say, well, uh, maybe the list has, uh, I don't know, 15 primitives and the array has, I don't know, 20 primitives or whatnot, and the dictionary has this many primitives. And there is some sort of nomenclature synchronization that there are primitives that work for everybody. Like, give me a, a random, give me a convenient element in a container. Any. Like, give me like, and the list is going to give you the head because that's the easiest. And maybe an array is going to give you the last one because that's the easiest to remove. And that kind of stuff. So they can make their own decisions. So that would be a required primitive. Uh, but for general containers, nomenclature is kind of, uh, it's a much more open space for doing this kind of uh, design and introspection stuff. And I'm going to bore you for the rest of this, this talk with, uh, thank God, it's only 15 minutes left. I'm going to bore you with check integers, which is the equivalent of like, if you were like, you know, working on a PhD there, 
right? That would be a, the equivalent I'm going to talk about, like plumbing. And you know, here's how you uh, change uh, faucet right now, okay? So check the integrals. You should know that the C plus plus is a thing because they don't. I mean, they, they have finite uh, precision integers. They have overflows and stuff, and division by zero and whatnot, right? So in C plus plus, it turns out uh, it's a big it's a big issue. Um, here's what happens: addition, addition with assignment minus whatever, all of these increment decrement uh, multiplication may lose information, uh, meaning overflow. Uh, you have division by zero in the, uh, you can divide by zero, this is easy to check. Right? Uh, you have a weird artifact here which not many people know, but you know, right? Not many people, uh, many people outside this room, right? You know, this is not actually also negative, <coughs> you know, right? This, the most negative integer, you take minus, you think it's positive, it's not. It's the same thing. Um, and they have some uh, weird things that come from the C legacy, which are things like uh, if I take the maximum uh, assigned integer and compare it against minus one, it turns out there's a stupid rule in the C language that converts. The rule is, goes like this. If anything in an expression is unsigned on a radius of one mile, then everything becomes unsigned. <laughs> it's, not, it's, a, it's in the standard. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, I quote from the standard, exactly. Except, except when integer promotions take part, in which case they become signed. It ah. gets even worse. I am in the right audience because there is an except and it has to do with uh, depending on the relative widths of the signed and unsigned integers involved. Indeed, there, there's uh, something called value conversion. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, I'm half amazed I even know this stuff. It's, uh, it's actually embarrassing. <laughs> So anyway, so we have this, uh, this uh, historical artifact that makes uh, expressions like that ridiculous, right? Uh, but, you know, the funny thing is this is pretty much it. So if you want to have checked integers, all you need to do is define a type or put it in a compiler, the language if you wish, put some rules that take care of this stuff. Pretty much uh, is that. So now let's look at designs. Um, well, integrate in the programming language. Raise your hand if you know pro a programming language that does that kind of stuff. Yes, please. Say it. Um, uh, uh, well, the the first step, Python. 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 Yes, thank you. So Python has what uh, it has unlimited precision integers. Is that right? Yeah. So it's not even. A, what's the disadvantage? Slow. It's going to be five times slower than itself, right? That was a joke. It can be, that would be an equilibrium, right? <laughs> like zero speed, right? It's really slow. So, that, you know, in a systems language cannot afford to have, uh, by default, unlimited precision integers. So, you gotta have uh, something like that, right? So, uh, fine. So, integrating in the programming languages has a runtime cost. Uh, do away with fixed fix size. This is what Python does. By the way, what's that, what does Ruby do? Ruby? I assume they have some because there's competition, right? So, they must do pretty much as good as Python does, right? Uh, anyhow, uh, the second would be have the programmer insert tests appropriately for an appropriate definition of appropriately. <laughs> and believe me, that is not tenable. Um, to wit, I have tried to do this and uh, it turns out that um, I worked on a large library and I tried this like for a file, a module. And before that, I mean, you lose the logic in the, the goddamn thing because every two operations is going to be a NIF. So it's ridiculous, you lose the logic of what's happening uh, just because you do all the, this testing. <laughs> and guess what, I forgot half of the tests. So <laughs> you run the risk of actually forgetting. Not, not, not speaking about, about maintenance there, right? So it's really bad. That's not gonna work. So then uh, we have the option to designate checked integral types, which is very nice. Um, and uh, they're going to hook all of the operations and going to insert checks, use, uh, and the user replaces the primitive types with uh, these check types. And then, you know, you're going to use either int or checked in a C++ application, depending on if you want it to be checked or not. Right? So this uh, requires uh, this feature in the language user, define operator overloading, right? Which C++ does have, and a few other languages, so F Sharp has it famously. So and other languages have that kind of stuff. So um, here it gets uh, weird. And it explains a lot about uh, why uh, people hate libraries. I think it's good to have a library for uh, asynchronous TCP IP. 
because not something that you can see then and write in an afternoon. But then people come, I'm, I have a login library for you. And say, well, login is something I could see then and write in an afternoon, and probably I, get a be I do a better job than you. Jerk, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, there's a difference between a library that has a, a difficult problem domain, like TensorFlow, boom. All right, thank you very much, right, Google, right? But, but you know, we get to like, I have a login library, I have a library for check integers. What, does it do any work? What does it do? It's boring, it's completely ridiculous. Well, I'll tell you where the problems are, because I wrote a couple of such libraries, and it turns out they're very difficult to write in, because of the following reasons. The, field, the domain is ill-defined. Because everybody's going to want, well, you know what, I want to check for overflow, but I don't care for division by zero, because the operating system takes care of that. Um, I, I'm okay with negation, because whenever it's important, I just use unsigned or whatever. Uh, I don't care for mix sign or mix sign are a difficult problem, because we have this internal on team who keeps on making those mistakes. <laughs> and it depends a lot on the, the context, right? Conversions, do I care or not? Do I want to, you know, what do I want to do on conversion? What happens if one of these uh, rules is violated? Do I write on the uh, wording on the console? Do I abort the application? Do I throw? Do I log? Do I fix? Do I approximate? Well, how about type system integration? Do I statically disallow certain operations or do I dynamically check for them? You, both, ni neither choice is wrong. Both are totally fine choices. Um, do I, you know, I want it efficient, etc. because this turns out to be like integer operations. If you touch that, it's going to affect like 37% of your bottom line is going to be integer operation, right? So, you know, how do you make it small and uh, uh, make it a proportional response? And it turns out that for these reasons, you can't find a checked integer library for C++ or the D language as it were. For either of these languages, you can't find one that is like 50 lines. You can, because every, everybody wants to do everything, right? So I speak about like one application, one guy, one team, one, uh, one instance, fine, it takes 50 lines. If you talk about like four, if you talk about a library, it's completely different business, okay? To wit, um, I looked at a uh, number of baselines here. One is Mozilla's checked in for C++. They, use, uh, they, they do, uh, to their credit, what they do is they, they have the slowest method for checking divisions in the world. They, have, they own this record. Um, the way I remember is they divide, uh, they divide the two and then they multiply back and convert the results. Which is kind of a, it's kind of a heavy thing to do for a, a checking division. You could simply look at the flag if you use assembler, or you could, there's any number of things you can do that are much better. Um, Microsoft set in for C++, that would be the death star of checked integers. It has like 5,000 lines. It has 15,000 lines of documentation. I'm not kidding. You gotta buy the DVD from NSD or whatever the hell they do, right? So it, it comes with a backpack of stuff, right? It's not easy. So this is like, I'm, I'm not kidding, it's a project and it's featured on the site and I think, I don't know, CNBC talks about it, that kind of it influences the stock market, I don't know. So they do stuff in there, right? That's Microsoft. Uh, then I have Safe Numeric, which is sort of a boost candidate. And again, it's a heavy library. It has thousands of lines of code. Um, and there's a check-in for D by, uh, by a colleague of, our, of ours, um, which is for the D language, and it, it's also a heavy library. Um, when I started this, I said, I don't want to be there. I want to use design my introspection. I want to use simplicity. And I gave myself a budget of 1,000 lines for code 1,000 lines for documentation, 1,000 lines for tests. And here's what I got. Uh, 1,200 lines of code I took away from the tests, right? <laughs> so you know, you, you do your budget, right? you fit in your budget. And documentation, I handle lines. And it's nice, they all come in one module because he has this automatic documentation generator. So it's one file that's 3,000 lines and you're done. And uh, the speed is just fine. It's uh, just as good as uh, handwritten. And uh, here's how I go about it. 
Um, I went with a shell with hooks approach, which goes uh, struct, you say struct checked, and here pass the integral type, which could be like int, unsigned int, or short, unsigned short, different lengths of ints. And then you have a hook, and by default you have a hook that's going to, whenever something fishy happens, it's going to abort the whole operation. Uh, by the way, again, um, the syntax primer, uh, struct check, these are static compile time parameters, and new element, we have a qualifier here that's going to restrict the domain of the of the, the structure. Guess what? If it's integral, I, you can It doesn't support floating point or strings or whatever, right? So this would limit the applicability of this particular type. So then we have the payload and the hook as members, and the payload is private because it must be uh, known only to the. It can be exposed for modularity reasons, but the hook can be public. And now comes a sort of a simple layout problem. What if the hook takes no actual space in the, in the data structure? If it takes no space, it shouldn't be here. And here's the first instance of introspection. So I have the layout is a private key, uh, payload. Static if the state size is greater than zero, then I'm going to have a member. Otherwise, I'm simply going to have a type definition, which takes no space. Yes, please. Could you just change it to have, you know, affect the gather, you know, uh, also, uh, okay, yeah, no, get, get hook and return, you know, the hook type you specify the compile time. Uh, can we have a function get hook and it either uh, returns the actual hook or some sort of a default hook object? Oh, you can also set the hook at the uh, right time. Uh, Presumably, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 the right hook, yes. So, anyway, this is a layout decision made by Meso Static If. Um, by the way, Mozilla has a hook that's always present, so they double the size of the integer. So I found it very uh, unsettling that they have like an integer that's like actually two words large instead of one word, right? So, um, so this is an important element, right? Um, so in the shell, this check thing is going to factor all common out. It's going to take all, all of the language specific nonsense, type system integration and stuff. And it's going to look, use introspection to look at hooks and ask the hook what are you interested in. Mr. or Ms. Hook are interested in things like, uh, do you want to set a different default value? Because it turns out there are people who want to set the default value to minus one instead of zero. Uh, what is the minimum and the maximum value? It turns out some people do want a percent type to be from zero to 100, not to cover the entire, right? So maybe they want uh, to limit that. Uh, if the hook defines these particular properties, the check shell is going to say, oh, wait a second, then I'm going to do something here, right? Um, interception of operation, hook cast, hook equals, hook comparison for inequality, uh, for ordering, hook all uh, unary operations, hook all binary operations, hook all binary right operations on the, on the other side of the, uh, of the operator, and hook the plus equal and that kind of nonsense. And then we have, so that would be what I'm interested in. This is what I want to do as a hook. I want to do things like when, what happens on bad cast, what happens on overflow, on lower bound, uh, fail, um, uh, uh, lower bound violation, or upper bound violation. So you can actually, any hook can uh, implement zero or more of these operations. And by introspection, the shell is going to look at whatever the hook is interested in and uh, make the appropriate decisions. Uh, let me show you something real quick here. Uh, I don't have it on slide anymore. So anyway, the simplest uh, test is you instantiate this with, um, you put void in this position. Void, the unit type. It should work just like an int. And this is your baseline test. Is it as efficient as an int if you have absolutely no interest in hooking anything at all? Right? You don't want to intercept any operation, you care for nothing, so that's good. So let me show you just, you know, you, this is going to be a, a bit uh, heavy uh, syntax-wise, but this is the way you intercept uh, the plus, plus, or minus, minus operators. You're going to say, my unary operator is going to work under these conditions, and well, guess what? If has member. Static if, do you have the member who could be unary, and then I'm going to do whatever you do, Otherwise, I'm going to do the, you know, the default. Right. And by the way, the default, I'm, I'm, just being, uh, uh, I'm just being a smart aleck here because I'm using, remember the mixing which generates code from strings? This is the concatenation operator. 
So that's going to be OP, which is plus, plus, or minus, minus, concatenated with the word payload, semicolon. And this string is going to be interpreted as code. So it's going to generate plus, plus, payload, or minus, minus, payload. And notice that there's two uh, semicolons here. This is an important detail. I don't want to see the error message that happens when you forget one of those. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. It's not too bad. But essentially, you've got to think two ways. This closes the statement in this, the, the real world. And this closes the statement that is going to be generated during compilation. So there's two times here that we're talking about. And there's a semicolon for each, right? All right, so there's a number of defined hooks. Um, abort throw, you know, I want to throw exceptions. I want to warn. I want to just output uh, load something uh, there. Uh, proper compare, you want to fix the comparisons on the fly, make them correct. Uh, this, this is the most interesting. Saturate. Whenever it gets like overboard, you're going to saturate and you're going to be happy. And the beauty of it is they're very short. So in 50 lines, you define a meaningful hook that defines a whole class of uh, an entire uh, category of, uh, of checked integers. Awesome. So, uh, folks, here's the thing. There's more to this. I can send you the slides. But um, let, me, um, uh, let me stop here with the following remarks. Uh, with some introspection, you use uh, the ability to look at elements of a program, such as types, functions, values, even entire modules, and you get to assemble with them in a very easy way by using this uh, introspection mechanism and these, uh, this static if uh, thing. You get to combine, combine static if with compile time introspection, evaluation, and generation. And what you have as a result is very compact and very powerful library components. Thank you very much.